Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You've already been cleansed by the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. So, tortillas, lavash, and pita. What possible connections are there among these other than the fact that they are all unleavened, unleavened relatively flat breads? I started thinking about this after I happened to hear a repeat of a cooking program on NPR a few weeks ago. The host was interviewing a restaurateur who is behind a new-ish restaurant in San Francisco that melds Moroccan and Mexican food. The chef is Mexican and had been running the kitchen at the Moroccan place that this new one replaced. Apparently, the chef had serious doubts about how this melding would work. The two cuisine, cuisines just seemed so different to him. But as they continued to experiment, it became clear that the base flavors were similar. The host of the NPR program was intrigued and began to explore the influence be, behind Mexican and Moroccan food and realized that the Muslims, the Moors, who ruled southern Spain from the 700s to the 1400s, shaped both the food and the architecture there. The same Moors shaped North African cuisine, where Morocco is. And of course, Mexican cuisine has a heavy input of Spanish-influenced food, melded with indigenous foods of the area. Those who went to the most northern areas of Mexico and those areas that used to be Mexico, like Texas and New Mexico, tended to be those who had been essentially outcasts from Spain of Moorish and often secretly Jewish cultures, those that Ferdinand and Isabella had declared to be undesirables in 1492. One of the guests on the radio program talked about the first time he had Persian food. He was served this wonderful, totally unfamiliar rice and lamb dish, and alongside a tortilla. He was utterly amazed until someone pointed out that it was not, in fact, a tortilla, but a piece of lavash, 
the ubiqu ubiquitous flatbread of the Middle East, served in Armenia, Turkey, Iran, and so many other areas. But whatever it was, it served to make him feel at home, to remind him of who he was. We are all so connected in ways that we can barely imagine. The first part of today's gospel passage, John's description of the true vine and the vine grower, is not actually the lectionary passage for this week. But the second part, Jesus' promise of joy to come to his disciples if they remain in community is. I needed to reach back for this vine story because it's the scripture that I chose for my ordination seven years ago. And since Jesse didn't use it, it was fair game. <laughs> it speaks to me of the strength that comes from being woven together in community. The power of being one of the branches of a true vine so tightly woven together that it is impossible to see where one branch ends and the next one begins. The resilience that comes from knowing that your connections can hold you up even if you can't do it yourself. Now, being the Gospel of John means that the passage reads and has been interpreted as exclusively Christian because that's just the way John rolls. Life for Christians at the time this book was written were, was hard. Choosing Christianity meant being seen as less than by the religious authorities. It meant potentially being cast out of the synagogues, possibly cast out of your own community or your own family. John's tiny little community was looking for a new way to be, a new way to define who and whose they were. And John gives them that way of seeing, that new way of being. But we don't have to look at the passage as being exclusive. Jesus in John says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. How about if we read this as I am one of the true vines and my father is the vine grower? <clears throat> After all, a vineyard is made up of many vines, not just one. If Jesus is our true and powerful vine and we are his branches, then how wonderful is that for us? But Moses is the next door true and strong vine with our religious cousins as his branches and on the other side in Abrahamic solidarity is Muhammad, peace be upon him, as, he's, as a strong and true vine with branches that intertwine with our branches. And on and on with all the strong true names that grow up under the tending of the one we call by so many different names. And the tending that God does in the vineyard Sure, God is the one who tends, but where do we think God gets the hands to do the actual work? Yeah, right here, and out there, and out there. That's up to us under God's guidance. In the second half of the reading from John, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. The branches that get pruned and burned are those that do not bear fruit. Those folks perhaps who live entirely for themselves, who don't think they need help from anyone, those who are unable to live in love and bear fruit, those who decide it's all about them and to hell with others. They don't want to be a part of the vineyard and so they are removed or they remove themselves because in order for the vineyard to be healthy, it takes all of us. There are other branches that have come unwrapped from the vine because they've been deeply injured by whatever has wounded them. A couple of years ago, I attended a Disciples of Christ retreat because uh, Rita Nakashima Brock was preaching and presenting a workshop. Her work on moral injury has focused on ex-military whose value systems were distorted by the things they did 
in defense of their country. Now, most of them know that they only did what they were asked to do, and often what they believed to be right, but the result was still against the moral codes they were raised with. And they were not helped to reintegrate into stateside society. Most, some of them, especially Vietnam vets, were treated horribly when they returned to this country. Often the therapy that helps these men and women the most is group work, places where they can tell their stories and others will listen with understanding and without criticism. Brock's latest book is called Soul Repair and Community is where we repair wounded souls. The South American term Ubuntu as popularized by Archbishop Desmond Tutu among others, roughly means I am because we are. My humanity depends on yours. I'm only a true human being if I recognize that you are as well. My little piece of the vineyard is healthy. Only if I help others to maintain their part and, and, and help with the weaving the wayward tendrils back into the main vines. The poet Galway Kinnell says, sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness. Jesse said last week that the Ethiopian eunuch didn't need an educator or an authoritative interpreter to ex explicate Isaiah to him. He needed a guide someone who could point the way and then let the hev Holy Spirit do the heavy lifting. Gregory Boyle, in his book, Tattoos on the Heart, tells a story about a young man whom he had known for years on the troubled streets of East LA. Pedro gradually sank into the hell of heavy substance abuse until for no discernible reason he decided it was time to get clean. And then 30 days into his rehab, his younger brother committed suicide. When Father Greg breaks the news to Pedro, Pedro lets the sadness in instead of masking it with anger and plans for retribution. In the car on the way to the funeral while Father Greg is searching for some for any words to say, Pedro breaks in with his insistence to tell about the dream he had had the night before in which Father G had a part. In Boyle's words, in this dream, Pedro and I are in a large empty room, just the two of us. There are no lights, no illuminated exit signs, there are no windows. In the dream, he seems to know that I am there with him, though we don't speak. Suddenly, in this dark silence, I retrieve a flashlight from somewhere and push it on. I, I find the light switch in the room on the wall and I shine the narrow beam of light on the switch. I don't speak. I just hold the beam steady, unwavering. Pedro says he knows he is the only one who can turn this light switch on. He thanks me for happening to have a flashlight. He makes his way to the switch, following the beam with, I suppose, some trepidation. He arrives at the switch, takes a deep breath, and flips it on. The room is flooded with light. He is sobbing at this point, and with a voice of astonishing discovery, he says, and the light is better than the darkness. As if he did not previously know this to be the case. When he can continue, he says, I guess my brother just never found the light switch. Boyle continues, possessing flashlights and occasionally knowing where to aim them has to be enough for us. Fortunately enough, none of us can save anybody else but we can all find ourselves in this dark, windowless room, fumbling for grace and flashlights. 
You aim the light this time, I'll aim it next time. Hoping and waiting for the astonishing light. Hoping and waiting for a guide. Hoping and waiting for the Holy Spirit. Guides. Like Philip last week, ordered by the Holy Spirit to teach and baptize the Ethiopian eunuch. A Gentile, like Peter, in today's reading from Acts, speaking to a Gentile named Cornelius, a Roman centurion. Cornelius has had a vision from God and asked Peter to come and talk to him and his family. And Peter also had a vision, the one earlier in the book, where God basically tells him that there are no unclean food items. And Peter has begun to realize that his mission has just gotten a lot bigger, has in fact been expanded to include the Gentiles in Jesus' family. Peter's Jewish followers are skeptical, to say the least, about allowing these Gentiles in. Those people are definitely not in our bubble. Until following Peter's sermon, the Holy Spirit shows up in all her weird awesomeness and fell upon all who heard the word with her gift poured out even on the Gentiles. Then Peter's followers heard them speaking in tongues and baptized a lot of them. So not only had Cornelius' friends and family been converted, Peter's homies had had their minds and hearts opened as well because that's how the Holy Spirit does her work. Jonathan Sachs, a British Orthodox rabbi, philosopher, author, etc., says that the supreme religious challenge is to see God's image in one who is not in our image. All of these stories demonstrate that there is possibly no such thing as an accidental encounter, that anyone we meet is liable to be in need of something we have. And Jesus tells us that we're supposed to be out there in the world meeting strangers face to face. Yes, we're supposed to love our neighbor, but when Jesus is asked who is our neighbor, we hear about the Good Samaritan. And Jesus' listeners know that Samaritans were the enemy, the ultimate outsider. Jesus is telling them it's time to face up to their prejudices. Maybe it's time for all of us to admit that the ones we think of as the other are scary, and we're supposed to go out there and hug them anyway, and walk with them, and hold flashlights for them, and teach them what we have to teach and learn from them what they have to teach us. Amen.